And actually, it gives us a very nice transition to the first session, uh, which is organized um, by Massimiliano Meinieri. Uh, Max uh, is my brother. We start our journey in Toronto 20 years ago. It's hard to believe how, how quickly time flies. Uh, Max is uh, always uh, involved in um, echocardiography. He's a member of um, national board of echocardiography, very active both in North America and Europe. He is responsible for uh, uh, European um, IACTA symposium or conference, which will be in Freiburg uh, in October. So he's uh, director of, of this um, fantastic conference as well. Uh, his role was uh, instrumental in organizing of the session. We have five speakers, uh, and the session will be chaired by Jacobo Moreno. Jacobo Moreno is also European. I'm from Poland. Jacobo is from Spain. He finished his anesthesia training in Barcelona. And uh, subsequently, he came to Canada, uh, where he completed fellowships in cardiac anesthesia, critical care and thoracic anesthesia he's almost almost overqualified uh, we both of us marcus and myself had privilege and pleasure to work with jacobo for many years recently he moved to different hospitals still in toronto sunnybrook and he's still very active in research in cardiovascular anesthesia uh, a lot of educational efforts he's organizing 3d the course in Toronto and in in Spain, um, it's becoming very popular. So Jacobo, floor is yours, and we'll be joining you at the end of the session for Q and A. Uh, once again, thank you so much um, to our European colleagues uh, for joining for their effort and fantastic presentations. I have a chance to see all of them in preparation for this course, but it will be a great pleasure to listen to them live. Um, let's get going. Thank you very much, Marcin, for the kind introduction. And uh, yeah, like um, the welcome uh, everyone and good morning to everyone. Um, as Marcin was saying, I'm Jacob Moreno. I was supposed uh, to be here with my <laughs> with my big brother, like uh, Professor Max Minieri, but unfortunately he couldn't actually join us today. So we will try to actually do the best of, uh, of it. Um, without uh, any further uh, dilatation, I, I would like to actually introduce the session one of the second day of the Toronto Preoperative Echo Symposium. It's regarding the right heart function. And, um, and I'm going to actually try to guide you through the lines up uh, of the excellence, the speakers that Max has organized for this uh, for this block. Um, today, we are, we are going to be focusing deep into various aspects of the right ventricular function, uh, which is uh, critical, but often un unappreciated uh, component of the cardiac care, especially in conditions like respiratory failure or when it comes to the to the point of making an RV failure prediction. So we are going to be starting with Dr. Fabio Guarrazzino, who will be discussing the RV arterial coupling, which is essential for understanding the RV dynamics. We will keep going with Dr. Michael uh, Van den Hubel, uh, which uh, will guide us through the RV function assessment and how to build the RV uh, echo loops, and uh, which is another very important uh, discussion for, for the RV assessment. Uh, next, we will hear uh, from Dr. Jacob uh, Labus on whether strain is the key to quantify RV function. And afterwards, Dr. Uh, Trish Katz uh, will explore the RV function in ARDS and respiratory failure, which are two critical conditions where the right heart is often compromised. Finally, we will have the pleasure to have Dr. Boucher, and, um, which uh, will delve into the echocardi echocardiographic assessment of uh, RV reserve before LVAD implantation and whether we can predict RV failure. Uh, remember that uh, we will conduct uh, with a Q&A session uh, where we welcome your questions and discussions. So without further ado, uh, let's begin with our first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Fabio uh, Guarracino. Uh, Dr. Guarracino completed uh, his medical degree at Padova Medical School in Italy 
he trained himself and specialized in anesthesia and intensive care. And if that wasn't enough, he decided to specialize too in cardiology. He is the head of the department of the cardio, uh, cardiothoracic and vascular anesthesia and intensive care at the Hacienda Hospitaliero Universitaria Pisana in Pisa, Italy. He's part, uh, he has uh, currently serving as the chair of the intensive care in uh, the forum organs and transplantations. He's a member from the European Association of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology and Intensive Care and from the Italian Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. He had the, he had the privilege of serving as the president in, uh, between 2022 to 2023 of the ACT-IC and he is an expert in, in extracorporeal support of the heart and lungs. He has written like numerous manuscripts uh, published in uh, peer reviewed journals, uh, and he used to cover topics as intensive care medicine, acute heart failure, echocardiography, and cardiothoracic anesthesia. So if uh, you don't mind, please, uh, Dr. Valentino, go ahead with your presentation, please. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the organizers of this symposium for inviting me to join the faculty. It was really a pleasure and an honor uh, to be invited. Uh, in the next minutes, I'm going to address the right ventricular arterial coupling, which is a topic uh, of interest uh, in the setting of um, right ventricle uh, evaluation. I have no disclosures related to this um, presentation. Oh, I think everybody in the audience today knows very well uh, the differences uh, that the right ventricle shows if compared to the left ventricle. Uh, there is a huge difference in terms of anatomy, uh, of function, uh, which strongly affects the um, ability of the right ventricle uh, to support the circulation. In this slide, you very nicely see a summary of the uh, differences between right ventricle and left ventricle in terms of anatomy. So you see that they are so different in shape, in uh, wall thickness, in mass, in volumes. Also, the ejection fraction is is slightly different and of course there is a large difference in pressures and in intracavitary pressures and interestingly the ventricular elastins uh, the afterload to the ventricle are very different between the right and left side and the adaptation to the imposed load is completely different we know that the right ventricle shows a better adaptation to volume overload whereas the left ventricle shows a better adaptation to pressure overload. And if we move to the uh, PB loop, uh, it's uh, uh, really very clear that there is a difference uh, between the right and left ventricle. You, you immediately recognize that the right ventricle uh, PB loop uh, shows lower intracavitary pressure. Uh, it has the same uh, diastolic profile as the, the left ventricle. But what is interesting is that there is a difference in the duration of the ejection. You can clearly see that the right ventricle is still ejecting while the left ventricle is already in, in diastole. So, the, the anatomic and function, functional difference can be very uh, clearly um, recognized also in terms of the of PB loop between the right and the left ventricle. And if we go uh, deeper into the, the PB loop, we can clearly recognize the different phases that characterize a cardiac cycle on the right side, as you can nicely see on the left of my uh, slide. And if you go to the uh, central part of the slide, you will immediately recognize the well-known uh, PB loop diagram showing the slope of the 
ventricular elastance and of the arterial elastance. And we know that it is the ratio of ventricular elastance to arterial elastance that describes the ventricular arterial coupling physiology. Um, I think it's very uh, important and also very interesting to recall what uh, Professor Pinsky used to, to say uh, when addressing the right ventricular function. And I think it's important to consider that the primary role of the right ventricle is to deliver all the blood it receives into the pulmonary circulation on a bit-to-bit -bit basis without causing right atrial pressure to rise. Um, this is very important because it is this ability of the right ventricle, this mission, I would say, of the right ventricle uh, to maintain the right atrial pressure as low as possible that allows the venous return to normally um, uh, arrive to the right side of the heart. And so the function of the right ventricle, uh, the ability of the ventricle to maintain low pressure on the right atrial side uh, means that the right ventricle is responsible for the venous return to occur under normal circumstances and then it's responsible for the cardiac output to, to be maintained. In fact, we know from the Gaitonian physiology that venous return equals the cardiac output. So uh, the right ventricle uh, really plays a major role uh, within the, the human uh, circulation. Ventricular arterial coupling, then uh, as a definition, refers to the relationship between ventricular contractility and afterload. Uh, its most objective metric is the ratio between ventricular elastance as a measure of contractility and arterial elastance as a measure of afterload. And I think it's nice to uh, remind all of us that the measurement of right ventricular pulmonary arterial coupling in humans was first reported 20 years ago. Now, uh, what ventricular arterial coupling really describes is the dynamic adaptation of the systolic function of the ventricle to the afterload. This is true uh, both on the right and on the left side, of course, But this also explains, uh, very nicely explains, the physiology, uh, the different physiology that both ventricles show. Uh, the right ventricle, as I already um, addressed at the beginning of my presentation, uh, can cope with volume overload, but cannot cope with pressure overload, whereas the left ventricle shows, clearly shows a different physiology. The optimal balance between the right ventricular mechanical work and the oxygen consumption is represented by a coupling ratio between 1.5 and 2. Uh, and this is very important to consider because this is a, uh, also a measure of efficiency of the system. So when the coupling is normal, it means that the mechanical work is performed at the lowest uh, possible oxygen consumption in that condition. Um, in this slide, I, I think that the, the two movies I'm going to show you can clearly um, help us to understand the importance of always considering the interaction between the pump, the ventricle, and the circuit, which is the arterial um, vessel, the circuit, the, the, sorry, the, the ventricle pumps in, uh, you see on the left side that a pulsatile pump, like a human heart ventricle, generates an intermittent flow. Whereas on the right side, you clearly see that it is thanks to the interaction with the circuit uh, 
that the, the same pulsatile pump generating an intermittent flow can see this intermittent flow get into a continuous flow. So it's really very important that we always, always consider the pump and the circuit, the ventricle and the artery the, the ventricle is ejecting into as a whole in terms of cardiovascular function. So if we look at the uh, right ventricular function and its interaction with the pulmonary circulation this way, it will be quite easy for us when there is a right ventricular impairment to classify this impairment as due to an increase in the pulmonary artery elastance or due to a reduction of the right ventricular uh, contractility elastance or to both. And this is a very um, systematic uh, approach to the right ventricular impairment. In fact, the pressure or volume overload or the, re the reduction of the contractility lead to a completely different uh, um, elastance profile on the PB loop. And in each situation, the ES to EA ratio will change and will nicely describe the physiology of the right ventricle in that uh, situation. And by looking at these changes of the uh, ratio between the elastances, we can nicely follow the course of the right ventricular impairment, starting with the right ventricular dysfunction, going through right ventricular dilatation, and as we know, very often ending up with the left ventricular compression and hypodiastole, hypodiastole. And it's interesting for us to recognize that these conditions, so reduction of contractility or overload, either volume or pressure, are very uh, common in clinical conditions that we meet every day. So for example, sepsis, or myocarditis, um, perioperative injury and ischemia, for example, after cardiac surgery, are causes of this uh, decrease in contractility or volume overload. And also there are conditions which we very commonly meet in our clinical practice, like acidosis, pulmonary embolism, ARDS, mechanical ventilation, that have an impact on the right ventricular pressure overload. This means that all these uh, conditions, all these causes, change the elastances, change the, the shape of the PB loop, uh, and so they immediately uh, change the right ventricular coupling uh, in our patients. And what is very interesting is for example, if we think about the increase in the arterial elastance, so the increase in the pulmonary artery, which is very often accompanying conditions like respiratory failure, for example, or of course, caricatural conditions like pulmonary embolism. Um, in these situations, the, the, the coupling can be maintained at the beginning of the, the syndrome, and it is when the coupling uh, falls when there is a non-coupling profile that the right ventricle um, steps into a ventricular failure characterized by a reduction in the stroke volume and a organ hypoperfusion. In general, uh, an acute right heart failure in our clinical setting is characterized by an acute right ventricular dilation. All this represents the basis for the complex um, physiology, uh, and I would say pathophysiology, that the right ventricle experiences when different etiologies, different causes uh, can cause right ventricular overload in terms of pressure or volume or reduction in right ventricular contractility. So 
when this happens we at the beginning of the process we uh, see right ventricular dysfunction occurring which is characterized by right ventricular systolic impairment and the right ventricular dilation which is the first phenomenon that we can observe of course in this situation we not only uh, appreciate a reduction in the ventricular stroke volume but the dilation of the right ventricle can also cause tricuspid regurgitation which is very important to consider as we will see but of course this systolic impairment uh, accompanied by the reduction in the stroke volume starts the the serial uh, effect on the ventricular interdependence because the reduction in the stroke volume will cause a reduction in the forward flow to the left ventricle. But after this initial phase of dysfunction, it's very important to consider that the ventricular, the right ventricular failure follows. And in fact, after right ventricular dilation, we see that the left ventricular dysfunction uh, is elicited by the systolic interdependence but also and this is something we should always consider the diastolic interdependence is strongly elicited and this is responsible for the parallel interventricular uh, uh, interdependence causing the hypodiastole the reduction in the left ventricular filling and then the combined effect of reduced right ventricle stroke volume and reduced left ventricle ability to accommodate volume due to this parallel effect lead to the reduction in cardiac output, the hypotensive state and finally to shock with multi-organ failure. So this is something that we should consider very seriously because as you can see on the right side here when we are in the um, time of ventricular failure, it's the uncoupling behind this physiology that causes the course of the syndrome. So the changes in the uh, um, elastances, the change in the coupling is responsible for this um, severe abnormality of the right ventricular function. How can we measure this? Well, of course, invasively by using conductance catheters, this can be done, but this is not the case in, in our setting, in the ICU, it's something we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot do in our uh, clinical practice. And so it's uh, uh, a fortunate situation that we have non-invasive ways to measure right ventricular uh, coupling. Uh, which allow us to non-invasively estimate the contractility and the ar arterial elastance. There are several, there are several uh, ways to evaluate on, with ECHO the right ventricular arterial coupling, as you see in this uh, table. Uh, but I would say that the one that has the strongest support in the literature data is the TAPSE to systolic pulmonary artery pressure ratio, which is commonly used in the clinical practice because it's, uh, it's quite simple, uh, it's quick, and it's strongly validated by literature data. Now, it's a long time that we know about the non-invasive approach to ventricular arterial coupling, not only on the right, but also on the left side, of course. And this is a, a, a very interesting approach in the clinical practice, because looking at the, these different profiles in our patients when we measure the elastances can really help us in understanding the pathophysiology and then making the right choices also in terms of treatment. And as I already said, uh, each of the steps of the right ventricular uh, cascade, let's say, going from dysfunction through dilatation, uh, through 
uh, LB compression can be nicely understood and comprehensively, I, I would say, understood if we look at the patient under this different approach consisting in the ventricular arterial coupling. As I already said, by doing so, by measuring the elastances, we can really classify the right ventricular issue and better understand the pathophysiology. Uh, very recently, um, with Professor Pinsky, we gave practical examples of how the measurement of ventricular arterial coupling can support the clinical work. And one of the examples we gave was exactly in the setting of right ventricular arterial coupling. And we referred to one of the common clinical conditions we meet in our uh, uh, clinical work, which is represented by septic shock in the setting of ARDS. Of course, the ventricular arterial coupling needs to be put into a systematic approach where echocardiography, measurement of elastances, the use of hemodynamic monitoring tools, dynamic ones, to assess the volume status, all together will support the understanding of the pathophysiology. And this will, of course, guide the treatment. So my conclusion is that the right ventricle is a pulsatile pump whose efficiency depends on proper coupling uh, between the right ventricle and the pulmonary circulation. Um, this interaction strongly affects the, the PVA, the pressure volume area physiology, and changes in either contractility or elastance, or even both, lead to changes in ventricular arterial coupling. And this is uh, very common uh, in the clinical practice. Uh, and what is very interesting is that nowadays we can assess this at the bedside non-invasively with the use of ECHO. And the combined assessment of ventricular arterial coupling and hemodynamic monitoring uh, can really improve our understanding of the patient pathophysiology and allows us to test the response to treatment, because this non-invasive evaluation can be repeated and repeated, assessed and reassessed um, in the clinical, during the clinical. So I would like to close by uh, reading this uh, tweet that was um, added to our recent publication. So understanding ventricular arterial coupling pathophysiology is essential for hemodynamic management and preventing failure of resuscitation in shock. Thank you very much for your attention.